born some 24 years ago as a fork of NetBSD. And we're currently running OpenBSD 6.6. .6. And the operating system's hallmarks are easy installation, quick installation, rich set of documentation, and very, very good uh, security features. What about security mitigations? Our next speaker, Steen, is going to have a very close and systematic look at them. Steen. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Steen, and today we're going to talk about evaluating OpenBSD's mitigations. So I'm going to explain to you why I'm here on stage. And then together, we're going to go to an arbitrary subset of OpenBSD's mitigations. And at the end, as usual, with talks, there is a conclusion. So why am I even here? Um, because like every good computer-related story, it starts on IRC. Uh, we were discussing with a couple of friends the exploitation of a particular vulnerability. And at some point, someone said, whenever I read RobChain, I'm reminded why I run OpenBSD. I didn't know much about OpenBSD. So I was like, why? Because OpenBSD is taking security seriously. Wow, that's a short statement. So I did what everybody else would have done. I spent dozens of hours uh, reading OpenBSD source code, mailing lists, um, design documents, PDF, and everything. And then I rented back on IRC. And another friend said, hey, you should do a talk at the CCC about this. That's a good idea. It's never going to be accepted anyway, so why not? So here I am. Yeah. Uh, so OpenBSD, it's an operating system, for example, like Windows or Linux kind of things, except it's based on NetBSD. It was forked by Theo de Rad in October 1995. Uh, the goals taken from the goals.html webpage of its website is to pay attention to security problems, fix them before anybody else does, and to be the number one most secure operating system. That's really cool. Also, be politics-free as possible. Solutions should be decided on the basis of technical merit. I really like this. That's nice. Uh, people had low expectation for my talk. Um, things like misinformation, low-quality talk, false assumption, international embarrassment, apparently. So we'll try to disappoint these people. Um, more seriously, when the talk was the abstract of the talk was published on the C3063 website. There were a lot of heated responses. Like, just look at the innovation web page, just look at the events web page, a lot of mitigations. How dare you say that OpenBSD is not secure? That's the point of my talk, actually. OpenBSD has a lot of mitigations, but I want to know if they are working or not. Having a list is not enough. Also, there are almost no exploits for OpenBSD. Well, there are no exploits for Temple OS or Haiku or Menu OS, but I'm not sure they are super secure. Also, OpenSSH and OpenSMTPD are really great. I know, I'm using them. This, is, this talk is not about OpenBSD software. It's about OpenBSD security mitigations. Someone else said that all the mitigations are complementary. Why are you nitpicking on small mitigations? That's just a hand-wavy statement. Like, everything is complementary. Don't you dare criticizing OpenBSD. Someone else said just read undeadly.org, which is a website dedicated to news about OpenBSD. But on undeadly.org, every time there is a new mitigation, everybody is cheering at it. But I haven't seen anyone criticizing the mitigation, saying there is a weakness here, or maybe this, or maybe that. And also, when I was discussing with friends that are writing exploits, uh, they are complaining about people fuzzing OpenBSD, not about new mitigations. Also, someone said that the title is clickbait, but apparently it's not clickbait enough because the room isn't full. So um, security mitigation, how do we measure security? It's really hard. Uh, Alva Flade designed the mitigator creature, which is a um, alligator always working to make exploitation harder. Like, yes, I killed his vulnerability, but it's not really helping. So what, how do you measure a good mitigations? How do you design good mitigations? Uh, Alva also wrote on Twitter, because apparently he dislikes writing blog posts for some reasons. Um, say that to have a good mitigation, you should avoid hand-wavy statements like, it makes harder for an attacker to do that. You should have stuff like, what, what uh, class of bugs does it kill? Or what CV, like, this is uh, killing CV 1, 2, 3, 4, for example. Or by how many hours does it delay the publication of a working exploit, for example. Because it makes harder for an attacker. It's not something that would be acceptable, for example, when designing cryptographic protocol or a security protocol like, yes, I added a for loop here because it makes harder for an attacker to get a clear text. It doesn't work as well. 
Um, also, for a good mitigation, you should ask your friendly neighborhood exploit writers about this. Like, hey, I've wrote this mitigation, it's killing this class of bugs, here are old exploit. Uh, can you bypass it, please? Can you try it? And also, um, code review. Where is the mitigation coming from? Did you read some papers? Or uh, did you come up with the idea yourself? Other people are using it, maybe? What is the, the code complexity? So that's, it doesn't guarantee good mitigation, but at least I think that good mitigation stems from these good practices. Also, uh, threat modeling. I think this is really important. Someone called Ryan Mallon said, threat modeling rules of thumb. If you don't explain exactly what you are securing against and how you're secure against, the answer can be assumed to be bears and not very well. So, for example, uh, there was a mitigation added to OpenBSD, and the commit said, I quote, thereby forcing the attacker to deal with the hopefully more complex effort of something something. This is not something you want to read in a changelog for adding a new mitigation. So here we go. Uh, in this talk, as I said, I'm going to go with you through a subset, an arbitrary run of OpenBSD's mitigations, where they're coming from, where they're invented by OpenBSD or improved by OpenBSD, maybe. What are they defending against? Are they effective? Are they killing exploits? And how is the outside world doing compared to OpenBSD? For example, Linux has been not really improving, but Windows has been investing a lot of money and effort and time into making it more secure. Um, why an arbitrary subset? Because I only got 45 minutes and a bunch of questions, so that's not enough time to go through every single one of them. Uh, there are not a lot of sources in my slides because I don't have much space. Well, it's a big screen, but still. Um, but there will be a website at the end with all my research material published there. Uh, I also put small puffer fishes at the bottom of the slides as a notation mechanism to express my opinions about the mitigations. So yeah, here we go. Um, attack surface reduction. Uh, Ivan Fratik, which is someone working for Google's Project Zero, said in 2019 that empirical evidence suggests that attack surface reduction is one of the most impactful things that could be done for product security. So this is a class of mitigations that should be really effective. Uh, privilege separation, privilege drop in 1997, a long time ago. Uh, Daniel Bernstein wrote QMail and the QMail was composed of several processes with only one running as root. So as an attacker, if you manage to compromise, for example, a process talking to the internet, maybe it's running with low privileges, so it wouldn't yield you automatically a root shell. That's really good. Postfix did the same the same year, and five years later, OpenSSH got privilege separation. So if you have a remote code execution, OpenSSH maybe it doesn't give you a root shell automatically. That's pretty cool. Um, Almost all OpenBSD written programs nowadays are using privilege separation and privilege drop. Privilege separation is to have different processes running with different privileges, and privilege drop is the idea of dropping your privileges as soon as you don't need them anymore. For example, when you are issuing a ping command um, on Linux, maybe on OpenBSD too, I don't know, the uh, a ping is set to ID because it needs to have high privileges to open a specific socket, and then immediately drops privileges to send the payload. So that's the idea of privilege drop. OpenBSD is using it almost everywhere. I said there, that's why I put five perfect fishes. It's a really good unit, I think. Um, for example, they've got rootless Xorg since 2014. That's really amazing, but they kept its situ ID. So it has resulted in a trivial local root on OpenBSD. OK, that's, that's just me being mean. Um, pledge. I really like this one. So in the Linux world, there's something called SecCom that was created in 2002 and merged in 2005. The idea is that the process could enter a mode of secure computation in which only the exit, SIG return, syscall are allowed, as well as read and write on already open file descriptor. That's not really convenient for real world programs. So SecCom BPF was created in 2012, and with this, you can restrict what um, syscall your program can make, for example. OpenBSD created Tame, which was renamed as Pledge in 2015. And it's a really amazing mitigation. I really like it. It's really simple to use because contrary to SecComp, it's not based on syscalls where you have to dig through your operating system source code saying, hmm, what is this syscall doing? Do I really need it for this Java program? Maybe not. I don't know. Here it's capability-based. So for example, you can say, hey, this program is only allowed to use 
standard input, standard output, or uh, this program is allowed to do DNS resolution, and that's it. For example, I think the NTP client of OpenBSD is running different processes with different pledge policies, like one is allowed to resolve the domain, the other one more privileged is allowed to change the time of the system, for example. That's really neat. Also, uh, it's more used than SenComp. SenComp uh, is mostly used like in Docker, for example, or Tor, IPT at some point as well, a couple of other programs, Chrome maybe. But in OpenBSD, there are 850 calls to pledge in OpenBSD SRC, so it's used a lot in OpenBSD code base, and I think it's really impressive engineering work, and it's working very well. Super effective. They've got Unveil, which is kind of pledge, but for files, not really. Um, the idea is that pledge allows you to restrict the view of your file system to a specific program. For example, if you've got a web browser, the web browser needs to be aware only of, for example, a folder for the cache and the cookies, and another one for downloads. And that's it. The web browser shouldn't have access to SSH keys, for example. It doesn't abort on violations, so if your program is behaving weirdly, like trying to access your SSH key, maybe you will get a log message, but the program won't be aborted automatically. It's used by 77 userland program, OpenBSD. That's kind of a decent number, because OpenBSD, by, with its default, install doesn't come with a lot of programs. Um, I think that this one is also really good. It's like Appamore or SC Linux running on Debian, Ubuntu, or Android, for example. But I think it's much better because the policy is residing inside of the program. So let's say you're using wget to upload some file on the internet. You can make the whole file system read-only because wget only needs to read some file on your disk and then upload it to the internet. Or if you're downloading a picture, the only thing that needs to be writable on your disk is the destination file for the picture you're downloading. You cannot have that with Appamore, which is more like, yeah, wget can only access this, and that's it. So being able to reduce the attack surface depending on what your program is doing, I think is really cool. Um, hardware vulnerability, we got a lot of them in the last two years. Uh, apparently, you cannot trust your CPU anymore. That's a shame. Um, here, I think the most interesting thing that I'm going to talk about is the reaction time, because it's usually faster to update your operating system than it is to update your CPU. And for some vulnerabilities, when they were published, researchers managed to write proof of concept in a matter of hours. So I'm quite sure that serious players are able to have production-grade exploits in a couple of weeks, maybe months. Um, hyper, 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 what? Hyper-threading. So OpenBSD disable hyper-threading support by default, which is a bold move, and a lot of people call their names because of this, like OpenBSD doesn't care about performance, blah, blah, blah. But they did some benchmark, and um, the performance impact is pretty low, except from some specific workload. And this allowed them to dodge a couple of vulnerability, for example, Lyft in userland, or MDS in its variants, like Zombie Load or Riddle, for example, as well as userland. So this maybe should have been in the attack surface reduction part instead of here. But I think it's really cool. It's a really bold move, and I I think it's a good indicator that OpenBSD, there are some people at OpenBSD that care about security. Spectre v123. The idea of Spectre is that the branch prediction speculative execution of your CPU has observable side effect. Like your CPU tries to be smart and infer some things, and an attacker can watch the, observe the CPU doing this and extract some data from this. So Spectre v1, which is the first variant of the Spectre attack, the mitigations. On Windows, it's compiler-based. On Linux, it's manually removing some gadgets using a magic grep. And OpenBSD, there is nothing, so you need to update your CPU if you're worried about this. Spectre v2, also compiler-based on Red Pauline's. Day zero for everyone, that's really impressive. Three months for AMD64 on OpenBSD. That's not a long-ish time, so right. KPTY, also Spectre v3. Kernel page table isolations. Day zero for everyone, one month for AMD64. That's pretty fast. Um, interestingly, and because I'm a mean person, OpenBSD got KPTY after Dragonfly BSD, NetBSD, and FreeBSD. That's just me being mean. There are other ones, Lyft, MDS, SwapArgs. Everybody was using the same mitigations, except that OpenBSD was able to dodge a couple of them for userland because they disable hyper-threading. That's really cool. 
So everybody pretty much the first week, day zero, day three, nine. Yeah, that's really good. And uh, for Lyft, interestingly, nine days after the embargo was Lyft, um, Theodorat said that there won't be any mitigations for OpenBSD 6.2 and 6.3, despite them still being supported at the time, which is an interesting statement. I'm, he sent this on the mailing list. I'm not sure if people know about it. Randomization. OpenBSD has a really strong focus on randomizing everything to make the life of an attacker harder. ASLR. So the idea of ASLR uh, is to map area of the other space at random location. For example, your stack is the random location every time your program starts. So is your heaps, your libraries, and everything. It was invented by the PAX project, which is the patch for Linux in 2001. And the same year, OpenBSD did a random offset for the stack. That's really fast, really neat. 2003, OpenBSD did a random offset as well for libraries and MMAP. And it took two more years to Linux to join the bandwagon. Um, technically, it's ASR and not ASLR for OpenBSD because the delta between the different maps is constant between the launch. For example, when you're running your binary the first time, you've got the delta between your, I don't know, your library and your stack, for example. And when you relaunch it, there are maps at different offsets, but the delta is still the same. It doesn't matter that much, at least still better than per boot randomization like Android, uh, iOS, and Windows are doing. Also, OpenBSD claimed to be the first widely used operating system to have ASLR, but there was Gen2 Arden before and Adamantix. I don't know if Gen2 Arden was more popular than OpenBSD because they didn't publish numbers, but I think, I'm, I'm not sure the statement is true for OpenBSD. Position independent code. So here it's not only the stack, the heap, and the library that are mapped at a random offset, but every time you're running a program, the binary will be mapped at a random offset, removing fixed point for the attacker to see where it is or what to overwrite or where, where to jump, these kind of things. Also invented by PAX 2001. Uh, Gen2 Arden enabled this for the whole user land in 2003, and Fedora and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux used this for CETUAD and network facing binary because there were some performance concerns to enable this mitigation. OpenBSD got support for Pi five years afterwards. 2011, Pi by default on iOS and OS X by Apple. There are a lot of text in this slide because I think that here the timeline matters. Um, also 2012, Android, that's really cool. And uh, 2012, Pi enabled by default on OpenBSD. That's pretty nice. Except that on the OpenBSD's website, it's written that OpenBSD 5.3 was the first widely used operating system to enable it globally by default on seven hardware platforms. Android was first for six different architectures. Fedora was first for eight different architectures. And also there was Gen2 Arden, Adamantix. Maybe they got less users than OpenBSD at the time. But also Apple enabled it for OS X and iOS. And I'm quite sure this is more mainstream operating system than OpenBSD is. Oh, it's still an amazing mitigation. Um, Carl, I really like this one as well. So July 2017, OpenBSD relinks kernel object at a random after after every boot. Like the kernel is linked, like if your kernel was a giant puzzle, the pieces would be shuffled and assembled in a different order after every boot. So when you reboot, your kernel looks entirely the same. And for example, on Ubuntu, every time you're rebooting, the kernel is the same. So as an attacker, I only have to have the same version of Ubuntu as yours, write my exploit for the kernel, it works. It will work usually on your machine. So it's pretty nice. It kills single pointer leaks and relative overwrites because if I can leak a pointer to your kernel, I know where the pointer is, but since the kernel changes upon every boot, it doesn't give me much information. And also relative overwrite, if I'm able to write whatever I want, but in a relative manner, I don't know what I'm going to overwrite. Uh, it's really useful against attackers that doesn't have an arbitrary read or a CPU side channels. So, yeah. Also, the debugability of this is really horrible because everybody has a different kernel. So if my OpenBSD crashes and I want to send you 
the stack trace, I will have a different one that you do, for example. Or maybe I'm not a power user, I don't know much about this, so I'm just sending you a screenshot and there is no way for you to know what my kernel layout is looking like. Uh, also, it doesn't work very well with trusted boot because you've got a different kernel after every reboot and you would have to sign it every time. It would kind of defeat the purpose of trusted boot. But OpenBSD, I think, doesn't really care about trusted boot, so it's all right. Uh, this one is interesting as well. They are randomizing like they do for the kernel, except for the libc and libcrypto at boot time. Uh, that's pretty nice, 2016. Uh, it also kills single point leak and relative overwrite. If an attacker has an arbitrary read, this mitigation is moot. And also, this one is vulnerable to blind drop, but OpenBSD has some measure in place to make blind drop a bit more difficult. It's useful against remote attacker, but since it's per boot, it's entirely usually useless against local attackers. Library order randomization. So here is not randomi randomization inside of libraries, but the library are mapped in a different order every time. Uh, 2003. Uh, this was also done by Android at some point by default. The smallish improvement over ASLR, but when you've got a single leak to a library large enough, for example, the libc or lib crypto, I don't know, there are usually enough gadgets there that you don't need to look for other libraries. Also, the entropy is pretty terrible because an attacker, I don't care about figuring the particular order of all the libraries. I only need my libc to be the first one, for example. So if I've got n libraries mapped, I've got one chance out of n to exactly hit this library the first try. So it doesn't hurt to have this, but it's not very effective. WX, this, I, the, this mitigation ID is to have the memory section either have writable or executable, but never at the same time. It's a pretty old mitigation. Uh, it was, I think, first made public by Casper Dick for Solaris in 1990 something something. Solar designer wrote a patch for Linux kernel for this as well. Um, it prevents the introduction of new code because an attacker cannot like put his code into a writable section directly jump onto it. This used to be the case in the 90s, but Nobody is doing this anymore because of these mitigations. OpenBZ was pretty late to the party. It took them a couple of years, 2002 for user land, 2015 for kernel land. Amazing mitigations, except that it's lacking things like PAX and Protect from PAX and uh, NetBSD nowadays, I think, or uh, ACG on Windows, or the kind of hardware equivalent in the Apple world, which is KTR in hardware. Uh, the idea of this is that the operating system will keep track of the memory allocation. For example, if you are locating a page as writable, it can ever, ever be mapped as executable. Even if you map it as prot known, for example, and then map it as executable. And this really prevents the introduction of new arbitrary code, because otherwise an attacker, if I've got, I know, some ROP gadgets and I've got code execution, what I can do is that I can allocate a section of memory, mark it as writable, put my payload there, map it as prot known, and then map it as executable and jump on it. So this, this is basically the attack adding new code inside of the binary. And when you've got mprotect, packs and protect, the kind of things, you're not allowed to do that. So you have to write your whole payload and wrap or use that only attacks. But you cannot bring your own shell code anymore. Um, yeah, WX refinement in 2019. So Theo said that he wanted to block direct syscalls from this area, forcing the attacker to deal with the hopefully more complex effort of using JIT, or probably even harder, discovering the syscall stuff directly inside randomly relinked libc. What is the point of this? That's, that's a subset of Pax and Protect that I mentioned previously. They are blocking syscall from executable memory. So if an attacker has an executable memory, he cannot issue syscalls from here. And the further refinement was to block syscall from memory that doesn't have the M syscall flag. So the operating system will map a particular section of your address space when your binary is running, and you can only issue syscalls from this portion of the binary. A um, couple of days ago, Samuel Gross did a talk about iMessage exploitation and this exploit would have entirely bypassed this mitigation, and it's not even present on Android. Because uh, when, as an attacker, you've got enough control to map 
an area as writable, put your code there, map it as executable, and then jump on it and then do a syscall, usually you've got enough control to just wrap your way to syscall stub wherever they are because you usually have an arbitrary read anyway. This mitigation is pretty useless. Um, I think this is the juicy part of the talk. It's about other memory corruption mitigations. Um, user and heap management, July uh, 2008, auto malloc by Otto Murbeek, I think, sorry for butchering your name. And uh, Damien Miller, it's an amazing piece of software. Uh, out of band metadata, so when your allocator is allocating some stuff, the metadata about the data that was allocated are kept separately. So as an attacker, if you've got an overflow, for example, you're not able to mess with the um, data that are here. Also, read-only structures. So as an attacker, if I've got an arbitrary read and arbitrary write, for example, there are some structures that I cannot mess with. Quarantine with delayed free. The idea is that once your program doesn't need the memory anymore, maybe you want to free it, but the free doesn't happen immediately. The section will be put into quarantine. At some point, it will be free. This helps to mitigate use after free, because as an attacker, it's a bit harder to know when the memory will be freed. Junking, like some, when some memory is allocated, there are junk that are put there. So as an attacker, if I try to immediately look into this memory, I'm not able to leak some things. Canaries to detect linear overflows or uh, linear underflows. There is a secret value that's put behind or before the buffer. And when an attacker, when I overflow it, the program will notice at some point that the canary value has changed. What pages? Oh, page alignment. The idea is to align your allocation per pages. So as an attacker, when I've got an overflow, odds are that I will fall into a page that is not mapped. Guard pages like canaries, but instead of putting secret values, you're putting entire pages before and after, map them at prot known, for example. So when the attacker touches them, everything will explode. As usual with OpenBSD, everything is randomized everywhere. It's a really, a really cool piece of software. Unfortunately, it's a bit slow compared to, for example, Scudo, which is the Google um, hardened allocator that they plan to use for Android. Uh, some benchmarks shows that Automaloc is 12 times slower, but apparently the OpenBSD people care more about security than they care about performance, and that's entirely fine. Uh, read on your location. This one is a more tricky to explain, but basically the idea is that when your program needs a, um, I don't know, a function from another library, like let's say you want to display some text, you use printf, and your binary doesn't implement printf. So it will ask you, hey, uh, where is the function printf again? And uh, there is a small stub that will say, oh, let me look, here it is, there you go, and the program will take the function, put it in a small cache, so next time it needs to call printf, you can just look in the cache and called printf. Uh, the idea of read-only relocation was created by Red Hat is that um, to make this cache as read-only. Because an attacker, for example, if the cache is not made read-only, what I can do is that I can swap the pointers there. For example, next time you're going to call printf, in, since I messed with the cache, you're going to call system and give me a shell. So the idea is to have this as read-only but the caveat is that you need, as a, when you're starting your program, to resolve everything because you cannot dynamically change the cache. But there is a plot twist. Uh, OpenBSD still has lazy bindings, which means that they're resolving things at runtime, but still having a read-only zone. This is a bit weird. But so the way they are doing this is by adding a new syscall called kbind. And the idea of Kabine is that it allows the program to have an, an arbitrary write inside every memory that is mapped uh, in the address space. So even if it's read-only, the program can still write there. So to prevent an attacker from using it, uh, there is a call side verification. Like the first time it's called, the operating system will remember where the function was called and also use a magical cookie to make sure that the caller knows the magical value to be able to use it. Unfortunately, uh, you can just wrap your way to, uh, to bypass the call-side verification. And also, the cookie value, when you've got an arbitrary read, is really moot. So I think this is a dangerous syscall. And the, good, the right way would have been to uh, 
have immediate bindings instead of still supporting lazy bindings, which are things from the past. Trap sled. This one is hilarious. Um, so Todd Mortimer uh, sent a patch to replace the padding between functions that used to be nops by traps. And the idea is to remove nop sleds from program libraries and makes, makes it harder for an attacker to hit any ROP gadget or other instructions after a nop sled. Nobody is using nop sled with ROP. Nop sled were used back in the day when the stack was executable. People are jumping precisely to the gadgets nowadays. You can look at every exploit out in the wild. Nobody is using nop sleds. Um, also, Microsoft Visual Studio had these features since the 2010 editions and never branded it to the security features. Also, OpenBSD has an obsession about removing ROP gadgets. They are doing this by changing the register selection algorithm. Like instead of using EIX, for example, they were favor EBX instead. Why not? They are also replacing instructions. So instead of moving A to alpha, they are exchanging A and B and then moving and then changing again. They are forcing alignment with the trap sled. There is a whole jump above a trap sled and the red instruction to prevent an attacker from jumping in the middle of an instruction and hitting the red afterwards. Also, they've got red guard to protect against the line red usage, but I'm going to discuss red guard a bit more after. Rub gadgets removal. Why? Why would you do this? Uh, because they are using a script called robgadget.py, which was written by Jonathan Salwan. It was written as a proof of concept for fun. Nobody is using it except maybe during CTF as a try and usually doesn't work because the heuristic it's using are pretty simple. And the way they are measuring the success is that they are running Rob gadgets on a kernel binary to generate a user land execv Rob chain. And the Rob gadgets that PY script managed to generate a full chain before their mitigations. And when they apply the mitigations, Rob gadget doesn't manage to generate the complete chain anymore. That's a weird metric. Also, apparently, all their dance to remove gadgets are uh, reducing the number to 11% on MD64. That's not a lot. When you're writing a rub chain, usually you need like, I don't know, a dozen gadgets, maybe 20, but not, not that much. And 11%, um, this, this doesn't make any difference. Like, there are still dozens of hundreds of gadgets lying around. Uh, they claim that there are no more rub gadgets on AM64. That's amazing. So I've run robgadgets.py on the kernel binary and remove all the red based gadgets. And there are still 12,891 12, uh, job or co op or pick up gadgets everywhere. Also, it doesn't kill, as I mentioned, rob co op, pick up, and all the return to, return to CSU, return to lib, return to anything. And Tio said that once they address the red problems, everything else would be easy to address. And also, in any case, substantial reduction of gadgets is powerful, except it's not. There was a paper published in 2019 by Michael Brown and Santosh Pade called Is Less Really More? that is explaining why removing rub gadget doesn't usually improve security and sometimes it even worsens it. Amusingly, GCC used to have an option called dash dash and mitigate rub. But it's now removed because, I quote, this option is fairly ineffective. Nobody seems interested to improve it, deprecate the option, so it won't lure developers to the land of false security. Red Guard. Um, so Crispin Cohen and his friends uh, wrote Stack Guard 1997. The idea, as I mentioned previously with cookies, is to have a secret value somewhere. And when the attacker tries to override things to memory, the attacker will also override the cookie value that's allowing the program to detect that something is wrong. Here, it's usually on the stack. Like when you're calling a function, the return address, because you're executing your program, some point you might want to call a function, for example, but you need to know where to come back. So the idea is that when you're calling a function, usually, at least on MD64, you're putting the return address on the stack, the function is doing things, and then it's taking the address back and coming to the call site. So as an attacker, if I can override this address, I can make the control flow of the program point wherever I want. Uh, OpenBSD, I did stack cookies in New Zealand in Canland in 2003, six years after the invention. And uh, amusingly, 
they were using a segment filled with random data for, uh, for this. And they marked it as static const. So the compiler was smart enough to say, huh, this is a static const segment, so it must be zero. So it simplified the comparison for cookies. So the cookies on OpenBSD were ineffective between 2016 and 2017. Um, so RedGuard 2017 edition, the idea was to XOR the do an exclusive OR on the return address at top of the stack with the stack point of value itself. That's an interesting move, except it doesn't protect against partial write. Like, if you can partially overwrite a pointer, you don't care about this. Also, if you've got a read primitive on the heap, because in the heap there are stack pointers, usually you defeat the cookies and the SLR. Kernel land, if you can leak some part of the kernel stack and the kernel text segment, you get the cookie for free. So this was not the smartest move ever. That's why they improved it with RedGuard 2018 edition. So here are some assemblies. Assembly, singular. Uh, the idea is to move like RedGuard thinks this is from the random, the segment with random data here, XORing with RSP at the beginning of the function. And at the end of the function, there is a verification that the value is still the same. And then a big jump above a trap sled and the return. Nice, that's nice. Um, R11 is still on the stack when you're calling different functions. So if you've got an arbitrary read, you can just leak the cookie values from all the functions above you. There is one cookie per function with a small improvement. Also, cookies are stored in a dedicated segment. So you cannot overwrite them, which you can do in other operating systems. And I think this is really interesting. The integrity is on the return address itself. It's not just a cookie anymore that is like shielding the return value below. But it, the integrity is on the return address itself. So even if you've got an arbitrary write, you cannot really mess with this. Oh, it's still a small improvement over SLR because, well, a small improvement, sorry, over uh, regular stack cookies because when you've got an arbitrary write, an arbitrary read, oh, I'm tired, sorry. When you've got an arbitrary read, it's still game over because you can leak everything. Null the ref can land. So the idea is that when you've got a null pointer at the reference, like a pointer pointing to zero in kernel land, like you forgot to initialize a function pointer, let's say. Since the zero, the address zero is in user land, what the kernel will do is that it will jump to user land. So as an attacker, you just have to map your shellcode there, trigger the null pointer at the reference, the kernel will jump there, and you've got code execution. Uh, the PAX project killed this in 2004 with scanexec, and apparently twice in 2004, and new ref in 2006. A detail here does not really matter. Uh, Ilya von Sprudel gave a talk at the 23 C3, that's pretty old, 2006, called the unusual bug where he demonstrated some null pointer dereference exploits. This was mitigated by Linux the year after with MMAP in a DDR preventing user land from mapping things at the very beginning of the address space to prevent an attacker from putting the shellcode here. Uh, 2007, to 2007, everybody was copy-pasting exploits for OpenBSD. It was a really fun time to be alive. 2008, OpenBSD prevented to map the first page as well. Uh, Theo Derad, which is the person leading the project, says he's not super proud of the solution. It seems best faced with stupid Intel architecture choice. It seems that everyone else is slowly coming around the same solution. It took them two years to implement this. I think it's the other way around. They were slowly coming to the solution. Smap, smap, all the friends. Uh, the idea of this is that you can enforce at the CPU level that um, things running on supervisor mode cannot access user land. For example, your kernel, maybe you don't want your kernel to access things that are residing in user land to prevent people from writing the payload in user land, triggering a bug somewhere in the kernel, and then jumping to user land. Forcing an attacker to put the payload directly into the kernel land instead. Uh, PaxUDRF was an kind of an emulation of this, implementing in software. Uh, the Intel and then IMD release support for SMAP and SMAP. SMAP stands for execution, so the kernel cannot execute stuff coming from user land. And SMAP is access, so the kernel cannot access things coming from user land. Uh, it was added in 2012. Everybody had the support for it. Amazing. And then someone burned a cool OpenBSD SMAP bypass, 
because they forgot to clear a magical flag on interrupt and kernel entry. So they were vulnerable for five years. It was a really fun bug. MapStack. Um, it's present on Linux. Uh, almost no practical use besides when you're cutting slash proc, you will see this memory part here is the stack. Windows used to have anti exclamation mark PS validate user stack because it's Windows. They removed it in 2012 because it was useless. The idea was to check that the stack pointer was pointing on something that was mapped at the stack upon every single syscall. There were generic bypasses from this, mostly by published by Ivan Frantic. The idea, number one, was to write a stub that called mmap with the map stack flag, put your payload there, jump on it. Or before every syscall, you can just make the stack pointer point to the stack, do your syscall, and then make it point to something else. OpenBSD improved on this. They didn't cite Windows mitigation or any paper. Um, and they're checking the stack pointer upon every syscall, but also page fault. Um, I think this is a really cool improvement. Except that there are some OpenBSD specific bypasses that are left as an exercise to the crowd. Uh, other mitigation that didn't fit into the previous categories, but I think they are worth mentioning. Sin cookies. Daniel Bernstein again, 1996, with Eric Schenk. The idea is to have a stateless storage of the SYN handshakes. For example, uh, when you are establishing a TCP connection, you're doing SYN, and then the server reply ACK, and then you reply SYN ACK, and then you can exchange data. It's amazing. But if a client sends SYN, 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 the server needs to keep track of everything at some point, will just blow away. So the idea of SYN cookies was to be able to store all the SYNs in kind stored in a stateless state. Anyway, it landed in uh, Linux the same year, enabled by default, everything is super great. And OpenBSD implemented it last year. Nowadays, it's kind of useless, because everybody on the internet can trivially dose you with terabytes of data for just a couple of bots, bucks by renting a botnet. Uh, maybe it's useful on your LAN, but if someone is dosing you on your LAN, you usually got bigger problems. Map conceal. Uh, FreeBSD, the idea is to be able to mark some section of the memory in your binary uh, as please never touch the disk. So for example, when you've got a crash, a crash dump, maybe you want to give the core dump to uh, the developer, but you don't feel comfortable leaking your secret SSH key, for example. Uh, so you map it as no core or don't dump or conceal, and uh, they will never be put on the disk. So you can safely give the core dump away. 2012 for Linux, 2019 for OpenBSD, they bragged about it. Uh, Ted Unang, which is a core OpenBSD developer, said the name conceal was chosen to allow some flexibility, like prohibiting ptrace, the idea to keep secret from escaping into other programs. It seems that there is a threat model issue here, because if you've got ptrace control of a program, you can just rewrite the code of the program to access the thing that is stored in map conceal or mount some data on the attack, I don't know. Development practice. I think this is important. They don't have any bug tracker. Everything is done by email. So you don't know if somebody is assigned to your bug or this kind of thing. You have to go through the mailing list. There are no public code review when they are pushing code. They say, oh, uh, Theo said OK, or Bob said OK, or Ted said it's OK. It's literally Theo OK at the end of the commit. Uh, there is no justification context or threat model for mitigations. Like, hey, I did mitigations make the life of an attacker harder. There is no paper, there is no threat model, there is just hand wavy statements. Also, a security issue when security issue a patch, there is an errata web page with here is the patches, here is the signature, so you can verify it's trustworthy, do patch. But there is nothing about is it a remote vulnerability? Are there exploit on the wild? Can I have a write up? Well, what is the context here? Do I need to reboot? Is it in kernel land? Is it in user land? No, just apply the patch and reboot. This doesn't scale very well when you've got hundreds or thousands of machines running OpenBSD. You cannot reboot all of them instantly. Uh, they've got no current integration. They've got stable release, and they've got current. Current is broken from time to time. Uh, my VM stopped booting like at some point every month or two, something like this. Apparently, it's accepted there. Also, they're using CVS for a version control system instead of other things. So they have no branches, almost. 50% uh, of the commit messages are less than 10 characters long. Hello world is 11 character longs. 
three quarter of uh, the message are less than 20 characters. So if you write hello world, hello world as a commit message, it would be longer than three quarter of the commit message of OpenBSD. Conclusion, right in time. Um, OpenBSD has really some, invented some really cool stuff. I really like Otto Malloc. Uh, I really like what Damien Miller is doing with uh, hardening OpenSSH, for example, and other things. Uh, they've also got an entropy gathering syscall that didn't mention. Um, also, yeah, they've got some good ideas. They improved some ideas of others, sometimes without giving credit. Uh, for example, they've got uh, tame pledge. They've got password hashing. They invented bcrypt. That's amazing. They've got some useless mitigations that are adding either complexity or are just hilarious. Trapsled, for example, the whole WX refinement, the weird rub gadgets, removal ideas, cabine, everything. And I think that this could likely be improved with systematic security engineering, like doing more tests, maybe writing threat model and everything, because the, the SMAP bypass, for example, shouldn't have been living this long. Also, nobody would create cryptographic primitive today the way that OpenBSD is doing security development. This wouldn't be acceptable. Why is it acceptable to develop mitigation this way? Proper mitigations, I think, can stem for proper design and threat modeling, strong reality-based statement like T skills, T vulnerability, or T skill T CV, it delays the production of an exploit by one week. And also thorough testing by seasoned exploit writers. Anything else is relying on pure luck, superstition, and wishful thinking. Thank you very much. Also, um, since I didn't put a lot of sources there, I did a fancy website with a crazy domain name. Uh, it doesn't address the question, is OpenBSD secure or not? I didn't address this in my talk either, because I think it's important to empower and help people to answer this question by themselves. Thank you, Stein, for this definitely systematic review. So let's go to the question and answers. Do we have any questions from the internet? I see a no. So are there any questions here in the hall? I don't see any people at the microphone. Nobody? Aww. Some more time to think about some questions. Guys, no questions. Ah, microphone number two is our starter. Thanks. Um, when you showed the uh, response time regarding some of the mitigations. Um, do you know if the OpenBSD people uh, had access to the uh, information ahead of time like the others? Because Linux and uh, Windows, I would assume they would have access to the information to be able to write a mitigation in time to deliver a zero-day uh, mitigation, whereas OpenBSD, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. I didn't mention embargo handling on purpose, because apparently it's a sensitive topic. Um, OpenTO say vehemently that OpenBSD never broke any embargoes, but they are known for not playing nice with embargoes, so they are usually nowadays excluded from embargoes, so they weren't included in the disclosure process. They just had to deal it in a rush. It was in a rush. Okay, we got a question from the internet. Yes, thank you very much. And there's one question. Do you have a response to the statement of OpenBSD developer Brian Steele that MapStack is something very different from similar implementations in Linux and Windows? MapStack, this is the mapping the, maybe I can show the slide again. Oh, this is confusing. Yes. Uh, MapStack, I said on Linux, is just used to, for cosmetic purposes. Windows, it was removed. But MapStack is the same idea of verifying the stack pointer upon every Cisco. OpenBSD improved it by doing it on page fault. It's an improvement, but it's still not a tremendous mitigation. OK, we have a person standing at microphone number four. So how do you compare the plate with the capability system on Linux? Because there is a such a thing on Linux, and 
how is it different? Um, on Linux, what do you mean by capabilities? Like, for example, we, that there is the, for example, there's cap, cap network bind that oh. runs the uh, capability for ping, for example, to create a raw socket or something. I, I can't remember the exact name. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. They are really confusing. There are a lot of them. Uh, the documentation is scarce. I think that Spender from GS Security wrote a blog post detailing all the capacities and how much of a mess it is. Maybe it's efficient, I don't know. But since it's not really usable by normal human beings, I think it's not a good mitigation. What I really like about Pledge is that you can just say input, output, and that's it, or network. And that's it. You don't have to mess around with a lot of documentations everywhere. Do I need this particular type of exotic socket in my Java program? I don't know. Thank you. All right. Another question from microphone number five, please. Uh, there used to be this uh, developer channel, the ICB. Is this something which is still active in OpenBSD, or did they switch to like IRC now? Um, I don't know much about. OpenBSD ecosystem and everything besides the mitigations and didn't interact with our community at all. So no idea. Thanks. Any more questions? So there is one more question from the internet. Oops, sorry. Yes. <laughs> and um, how does OpenBSD compare to FreeBSD in the context of your talk? I don't know much about OpenBSD. Maybe I will do a talk next year. Um, no, more seriously, there is the Harden BSD project, which is a soft fork of OpenBSD, of, of FreeBSD, trying to improve the security of FreeBSD, but I don't know much about it. Okay, any more questions in here? We still have time. Internet? No questions anymore. Well, I'm then going to close this session here. And thank Stein again with a nice applause, please.